We have mentioned several times and we'll be mentioning over and over again those four words. What upholds your existence? As happy as me, you never see. The primary object of examining this topic of life, love, UFOs, and parallel universes as part of what's it all about is, what do you believe? And moreover, what part does it play in your life? That's the most important thing of all. Um, every week, millions and millions of people go to places of worship, churches, synagogues, mosques. Um, if you were to do a poll on the street, and stop people randomly and say, uh, do you believe in God? Do you believe in some force, some power? Most people would say yes. Um, you can have a smattering of atheists and agnostics, certainly, but by and large, people at least think they believe in something. The question is, what is it that you do believe in, and does it play a part in your life? Does it actually have something to do with your lifestyle? You're living, loving, creating. In other words, does it have meaning? Or is it just this thing out here that you could call spirituality, uh, beliefs, um, universal forces, whatever, etc., and so on. Um, from my experience with people, um, I find that uh, very few people are true believers in, pr in the practical sense of I believe this, and this is how it plays a part in my life. It really is me. I really do center on this during the course of my days, weeks, months, years of living. So that's the real purpose in this. A um, few thoughts on that subject by Einstein, of course. He was convinced that he, God, does not play dice. Um, and what he basically meant by that was that... Uh, this huge thing called the universe, which is bigger and bigger every day, it seems, it's still expanding, and we um, cannot begin to fathom how large it is. I mean, uh, as great as our imaginations might be when it comes to really picturing what this universe is like, I mean, how can you see, imagine, hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of trillions of universes and stars and galaxies and oh my goodness, it's so, be, there's no word to describe it. Enormous, immense, you can't find the word. Um, so what's it there for? Was this force that we might call God, you know, just shooting dice and saying, okay, randomly, this place called Earth will have life. Uh, he didn't believe that, he, he thought, there was a form to it, a purpose to it. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't just a chemical or biological explosion that took place and suddenly behold the universe. He also said that imagination is more important than knowledge, of course, which is why he was able to do the things he did. Is the origin of life a common, a common phenomenon or are we alone? doesn't seem possible that we're alone unless, you know, everything dealing with the universe, quantum physics and uh, relativity is totally mistaken. How could we possibly be alone? How could all of these hundreds of trillions of places exist and our little tiny Earth be the only place where there's life? It doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, uh, but since it doesn't make any sense, once again, what does that mean to us? If life does exist, what does that mean? Uh, and one of the things that strikes me immediately is that we're too limited in our general scope of what life could be. We think along the lines of uh, life being this human form that we have. 
body, mind, senses, heart, brain, immune system. We walk around, we have hands and fingers, and we do this thing called thinking and feeling. So when we think of life, we think of this form, or we can extend that and say, uh, the aloe vera plant, that's another form of life, plant life, uh, animal life, um, bird life, fish life. We think of these forms. And so when we think of if there's life out there, it must have some form similar to ours. Well, that doesn't necessarily make any sense. I mean, when you consider how many different types of plants alone that there are. I don't know if you've ever walked along a and just examined each plant, each flower, and said, my goodness, how could this have ever been created? Even one of them alone is astounding, but there's so many. On another level, let's say um, that on this planet Earth, there were no such things as elephants, or giraffes, or, or um, caterpillars, or spiders, um, say that a large number of the species that now exist did not exist in our lifetime. So we grew up with, uh, yeah, there were dogs and cats, you know, and mice, and there was a tiger, and, but there were these other strange things, you know, like an elephant with the tusks and the long trunk, you know. Now supposing someone said, well, there is this planet, and on this other planet, in another galaxy, there's this thing with tusks and trunks and everything else, and there's this thing called a dinosaur, you know. He would stop and say, what? It would be hard to imagine, wouldn't it? So what I'm getting at is, why do we have to think of the living form being limited to what we know? Why couldn't it take a thousand other shapes, a million other shapes and forms, why does it necessarily have to have oxygen to breathe or light? Why does it need to eat food or drink? Couldn't other species exist under other conditions, including conditions that we can't possibly guess at? When we were working on a movie in Hollywood with a team of artists, I asked them, if it was possible for them to create new colors. And they looked at me and said, well, what are you talking about? How could we create a new color? There is no such thing. And I said, who told you that? How do you know? How do you know that in other places in the universe, there are not things called colors that we would call colors that are different than our colors? Again, why are we so confined to our understanding of life and space and everything else. Um, where have we come from? Where are we going? We have Darwin versus the Bible versus invisible intelligence, or um, I personally have never been totally in tune with either Darwinism or the Bible. I'm not sure why, because I, I know that was what I was thinking as a youngster when I first came across it in comic book form. And my first thought was, couldn't it be something else? Why must it be, again, do you notice the polar kind of idea again? One or the other. Most people never stop to think about this. You know? We're polarized in so many ways, you know, is Republican or Democrat, right, wrong, good, bad, yes, no, black, white. All of the issues of our times are polarized. The vote last election was busy, polarized again, 50-50 as usual. Well, why is it that we have to think that it has to be the Darwinism or the Bible? I personally uh, find it, uh, I find that thinking you know, very, not just limited, but it makes no sense to me. Actually, it does not make sense to me. Um, for instance, when I think of the human being. We have how many different races of human beings? Five, six, seven different races of human beings? Why couldn't 
those different races of human beings have come from different places in the universe. Why couldn't the elephant have come from a different place in the universe? Or the cat or the dog? Why have we created this? It has to be this or it has to be that. Which makes absolutely no sense to me, any more than any kind of polarized thinking makes sense to me. Um, what makes sense to me is that we know that our planet, like most of the universe, has been bombarded by so many different things over the millions of years that it's existed. Asteroids have bombarded it, left all sorts of things here, debris, different elements. We also have reason to think, at least along the lines of having been visited by other beings, creatures, whatever they are, because there is evidence to show this to be true. We have found evidence dating back thousands and thousands of years of descriptions and pictures, not pictures in, in the sense of photographs, but of drawings on, in caves, you know, carvings of things that appear to be extraterrestrial that have been here. Why couldn't those have brought other species, other beings here? To me, that makes more sense than Darwinism versus the Bible. Just 50 or 60 years ago, we're talking about in my lifetime, you know, 1950s and 60s and that period of time, the renowned scientists the people who study the universe, the theorists, the mathematicians, the cosmologists, although they were in disagreement about many different theories, including the typical polarization between relativity and quantum physics, um, but they all agreed on one thing by and large. If you could have gathered all of them together, say the two or three thousand really top people who studied the universe, they agreed upon one thing, that one thing being that our galaxy, the Milky Way, was the only one out there. And that's reality. Just 50, 60 years ago, all these great minds were telling us we are the only galaxy, the Milky Way, nothing beyond that. And suddenly, you know, one telescope began to look somewhere else, or, and now suddenly there are trillions of these things. So how smart are we really? How much do we really know if only 50 or 60 years ago we didn't know that much? I find that extraordinary and very frustrating how we can be so damn sure about so much um, and lock ourselves into those positions. Um, I find that to be the greatest weakness in the human mind. Something is brought about by someone's study or research or theory, and if it goes unaccepted, uh, unchallenged for a period of time, then it, it's locked into, that's it, for good. I said very recently about the thing about water as an example, that we've been told for how long God only knows that we must drink eight to 12 glasses of water a day. And I have laughed at that for at least 50 years. It made absolutely no sense to me again. Just how, how, how do you know that? The reason I know it makes no sense is because I started boxing at the age of 11. And I know when I would sit down after a round and got some water, I'd spit it out. I didn't swallow the water. I didn't need it. And I know people who've gone with very little water and other people who need a lot of water. I never drank water. No, I drank Coca-Cola, <laughs> Pepsi-Cola, orange juice. And I knew those things had water in it. But yet no one was talking about it. Everyone talked about water as if it was the separate thing and it was not anywhere else. You have to have water to have water. How crazy can you get? Everything has water in it. Every time you ingest any food, any drink, it has water in it. Yet for all this time, people have been saying, you need eight to 12 glasses of this 
thing called water. And they also said, if you go more than a couple of days without it, you will die. And I knew that was a lot of nonsense. Because I knew even back then I could go longer than that and not die without water. And I know that I have gone 31 days without food or water and haven't died. I'm still here. And I'm not extraordinary in that regard. Tens of thousands of people, for instance, in India have done the same or much, gone much longer and they haven't died. And about seven years ago, a 17-year-old girl was driving her car, car in the Snoqualmie Pass during winter and it went over a ridge, went down deep into snowbank, covered, the door was locked, she couldn't get out, she didn't have a cell phone, had no food or drink, nothing in there. They found her eight days later. Yeah, she was a bit dehydrated, but she was alive and well, no problem. But again, just these ideas that go unaccepted and everyone buys into it, instead of saying, one second, where does this come from and what are you talking, it just sounds like another one of these deals where someone came out with some big study and it went along, no one challenged it, and suddenly it's the law of the universe. The known universe that we have just begun to glimpse, indeed. Probabilities, quantum physics, developed intelligence, these are all different studies that uh, lead us in some direction, usually a polarized direction without any real wide-range opening of the human mind and what could be there. Life after death, reincarnation, limbo, karma. Well, going back to that same point of what do you believe, if you believe there is life after death, then how do you relate to it? How does it actually affect your life from day to day? Again, so many people say they believe in some form of life after death. So many people believe in soul, in spirit, in consciousness, yet only a tiny, tiny fraction of those people really take into account what that should mean in their life and what they should do with it. The existence of the soul, soulmate, soul migration, how many people believe in the soul? What does that mean to you when you think about it? What is, what is soul? Any? I think it's defined many different ways for different people. How would you define it? Uh, for me, it's just that non-physical part of me, my okay. non-physical existence. Okay. Mary, what does it mean to you since you raised your hand? Oh, I, I, I just know it exists. I mean, I just have this feeling that it exists. This fair fair enough. That I want, I want it to be real. <laughs> okay. I think it's the part of me that just says maybe talks to me in my head, or you know, the the thoughts that I have, and interestingly the enough, the essence of a person, kind of. Interestingly enough, we can't see thoughts, can we? Uh, I would say it's an energy. Science energy can't be created or destroyed. Right. So, um, by definition, how can it really be destroyed? Uh -huh. right. It can be transformed, but not destroyed or created. Uh -huh. So, that's an interesting question that we'll go back to in a bit. Um, Tucker's concept, calling upon a departed soul to return. You've heard me speak of Tucker, this. Indian spiritual teacher, mystic, um, who was thought of as God by millions of people. Tucker believes in soul very definitely. In fact, when it comes to um, creating a human being, conceiving a human being, what Tucker taught was that at the moment of conception, you must be in touch with that soul that departed soul that you're calling upon to return in the form of your new child. And when Nan and I conceived our first child, 
It was in the water in Greece, and we had talked about this at length, talked about the souls that departed souls that we might consider and want to return. And uh, we chose my father as the soul that we wanted to return um, as our first child. And at the moment of conception, I saw a vision of my son. I knew it would be a boy, and I saw his face very clearly in my mind. And when our first child was born, there was the exact vision that I had seen, um, as Tucker pretty much described. Um, can I prove this? Can Tucker prove it? Can anyone prove it? We haven't gotten to the point where we can prove such things, but if we believe in such things, then how do we use that in our lives? Do your beliefs have a bearing on how you lead your life? That's really it in a nutshell. If you were to sit down with a piece of paper and a pen and ask yourself, what is it I really believe in? Really believe. Think, feel, experience all come together telling me I believe this. This is something I accept, I acknowledge. Well, then next to that, describe how you are actually implementing that in your life, if you are. Because if you're not, then it could easily be an area of your life that is really missing out on something that's really depriving you of something so essential, because we think of the essentials as food, drink, air. Why not add this as an essential? Your belief system, your value system, what does it really represent in practical, everyday terms? What is paranormal? Close encounters, extraterrestrials, UFOs, alien abductions. We hear a lot about these things. Um, extraterrestrials and UFOs and alien abductions, all of these things are, if we believe in it, if we accept it, they're easily interconnectable, interconnected, exchanged with one another. Um, how many people here believe in such things as UFOs? Anything. Okay. <laughs> Anything's possible, and everything's possible. All right. Good. Um, I've done a lot of research on UFOs. Um, it started when I was in military service. I attended a seminar, a lecture, given by a former Air Force captain named Keo. He had been a squadron commander. Um, I think at, um, where was it, Maryland, uh, at, outside of Washington, when that major report of UFOs happened, I think this was back in the 50s, over Washington, D.C. And the report stated that several squadrons were told to get in the air quickly because the radar screens were filled with these things, these UFOs, and Keo was one of the squadron commanders that went up. Now we're talking about dozens of pilots in jet planes over Washington, and all these people saw the exact same thing. When they landed, they made out the same reports. Unidentified, unidentified flying objects going at speeds beyond anything we have. So it wasn't like one, you know, drunken farmer out in the Midwest somewhere <laughs> saying, hey, I just saw a fly thing get up there, it's a big flying thing, you know. <laughs> uh, Air Force pilots, a squadron of them saying, the next night the same thing. I have spoken to at least oh, over the years a dozen airline pilots who have calmly described flying sources to me and have described situations where all the passengers were aware of the same thing. All looking out there and saying, my God, one of these flying saucers. So um, 
What does that mean? Is it all nonsense? We know that certainly 95% of the reports are hokum. You know, it's not the drunken farmer in the Midwest, it's someone who sees a reflection or sees a balloon or whatever, you know, or imagines it or wants to believe it or wants attention, you know, so he says, I saw a flying saucer or whatever. Um, but what about those percentage, those numbers that there is no answer for? Weren't balloons, weren't reflections, weren't a nearby Air Force base with a, you know, whatever they said it was? What about those? In 1968, I took my first vacation, um, and it was rather unusual for me to take a vacation. It was a 10-week vacation. And I went to Greece, and I got aboard a boat called an old-time, lovely, beautiful boat called the Semiramis. Uh, about 100 passengers was what it could handle. Big crew, though, for 100 passengers. It must have been a crew of about 25, and marvelous food and entertainment. And, uh, and we visited the various islands. We went uh, from Piraeus, uh, the port in Athens, to... Um, uh, Syros, Paros, Naxos, Eos, Santorini. Then we came back and we were outside of Mykonos for our final day on the boat. Mykonos uh, doesn't have a port where, you can, where the ferries can come in, so, and the boats can't. No, they have to come in with, on, on smaller boats. Smaller boats go out and take the people and bring them in. So you're offshore. And uh, they held a farewell party that night, and I have the picture inside which I will show you. You've seen it of me, I'm with two young ladies and I'm wearing uh, Grecian robes. It was a costume party for the closing night. And uh, we were all drinking. I was at the table with these two young ladies, a Brit and a Canadian gal, and uh, another guy joined us, a, a French-Peruvian doctor. Yeah, we'd been drinking and having a lovely time, and we decided about 11 o'clock at night to go up on deck and have a smoke and maybe, maybe some romance, you know, something might happen, great. So the four of us go up on deck, and it's a beautiful, beautiful night, no, no, no moon. Um, this is Mykonos. There's no, there's no airports over there with flying big air force planes. There's no balloons. There's no military, nothing there. This is the Jet Setters Island where people go to bathe nude and do whatever the hell they want to do. Um, and we're out in the middle of the sea, and we get up on top of this platform. We're lying back and smoking and having a drink and just talking. And we look up and uh, we see a formation of lights crossing the sky at a very high speed. And we're all watching this and saying, you see that? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. and then disappears. That was strange. You know. Suddenly the lights come back. And for the next 10 to 12 minutes, these things are moving closer and closer in zigzag forms and making moves. I spent four years in the Air Force. I know a good deal about aerodynamics. No thing, no plane, no rocket, nothing we have can do anything like this. Zooming in, back, making turns and twists, in formation, out of formation. They seem to be coming toward us, watching us. I think they were trying to figure out you know, what the Seminimus was doing there, or what kind of food we were serving or something. <laughs> we watched it, we chatted as we were watching it. Four adult human beings. Yes, we'd had a little to drink, but we were quite sober. You know, you've had a drink or two, and if you see it, you know, something weird or strange, and you're not going to say that it's the alcohol that you're seeing, especially if you're with other people. 10, 12 minutes of this. We undoubtedly saw flying saucers that night, and when these things went back into formation and then disappeared, we sat up there and talked about what we'd seen, sharing the same experience. So I've seen flying saucers. So have many other people. And having seen flying sources, it means something indelible in my soul. There is life out there, as we would expect there is. Ancient aliens and lost civilizations, Atlantis, 
um, Akrotiri on Santorini, um, huge excavations there going on for many decades, and they've dug down below many cities and came up with this remarkable example of a civilization that exists in eons ago. And when you walk there, you're amazed because these were buildings not unlike buildings we have. They have water systems and plumbing. Could have been Atlantis, it could have, but it certainly, you know, the Greeks didn't create this, make this up, you know, this is real. So these things existed in ancient times. So there is so little that we actually do know. We haven't even begun to scratch the surface, literally, of what exists. Who built the pyramids, Stonehenge, the Nazca Lines? Who built these things? People have been theorizing for God knows how long about the pyramids and how it was possible to build these things. They've come up with some strange answers about um, pulley systems involving tens of thousands of slaves pulling one stone at a time. And then when they study these stones, and they study not only the pyramids, but other places throughout the world where we know we're talking about something that was built thousands, thousands of years ago, and everyone who knows anything about this says the same thing. We cannot duplicate what they did. They're perfect. We cannot, with all our great technology, duplicate what they did thousands of years ago. Now, how the heck did that happen? Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, Abominable Snowman, well, that's in another range of topics. Not proven, certainly, um, but yet there are those people who have been interviewed and uh, about things like this who are sane, who are normal people, who give you no sense of trying to gain attention or you know, promote themselves in some way, who have seen these things. Unexplainable disappearances. Oh, that's happened frequently. There are thousands of such unexplainable disappearances where people were on a bus and swore that they saw this human being, child, whatever, adult, seated in that seat back there, you know, and suddenly the person's gone. And then a police report, nothing. They can't, they never found the person. There are thousands of such disappearances that have been unexplained. The spirit world, mentalists, mediums, clairvoyance, deja vu, um, psychic readings, telepathy, ESP, precognition, telekinesis, all these things, they're to the average mind, kind of dubious or skeptical, but yet we've seen things that we cannot explain. Near-death experiences, the white light, past life regression, well, there been thousands and thousands of reports of the white light. Now some people say, well, that just shows you that people are just copying others. They said, oh, this person was near near-death experience, so they saw a white light, so now it's Typical thing to say, you saw the white light. But we're talking about thousands and thousands of individuals who have you know, been interviewed in different parts of the world. Um, are we so damn sure that every one of these people is just uh, imagining or wanting to see a light or lying about it? I don't think so. What have you witnessed and heard the preternatural and the supernatural, seeing ghosts. Anyone here seen any ghosts? Uh, I think I did. You have? As a kid. As a kid, what do you remember? Well, it was like an angel with a woman. Oh, okay, bizarre. the full thing. You saw the full thing. Okay. <laughs> I saw the whole thing. Okay. At my family's <clears throat> house. I went in my aunt's room and it was dark, and I remember I had this white 
thing in front of me and I just kept blinking and blinking and looking and I was like, you know, it, in my mind it was, it had wings and it was like this white thing and I ran out. <laughs> How old were you then? Maybe nine. Maybe nine? Okay. Yeah. Do you think it was real? <clears throat> I don't know. You don't know, okay. I mean, to me, I'm, I'm speaking about it now. I think it's some way it was. In my imagination, maybe I saw it, but I just remember it was bright and I kept blinking and it wouldn't go away. And then I went out and left the room. I know quite a few people have seen ghosts. I saw my one and only ghost in about, uh, we were still living in the loft then, that would be 73. It would have been about 70, between 75 and 77. We had a very large loft in New York City, a three-story building, and there was a loft on the top floor, the third floor, and the second floor, which we also had, and then there was a hardware store on the ground floor. Had one um, entrance, which we locked, uh, and the windows were barred because it was a, a rather criminally infested neighborhood at that time. And uh, one night, Nana went to sleep about 11 o'clock, and she came out of bed for a moment and said, Nicholas, do me a favor and go downstairs and check and see if I have enough zippers for large pillows. We had a pillow factory down there. We made large, plumpy pillows for groups, and we sold thousands of these things also. Um, I never told you that probably, but we were in, we ushered in the pillow as furniture on the East Coast in New York City in the 70s. Um, so I said, sure, I'll go down, and I was watching TV for a while, and then uh, before going to sleep, I went downstairs. I brought my key, unlocked the door, and opened the door to the loft to see how many zippers there were there. And I looked across the room, and there was this man sitting there. Now, I am quite an alert human being and can respond to natural fear instantaneously. Um, but I felt no fear. I was immediately aware of the fact that this was a human being sitting there. He didn't come in through the barred windows. He didn't come in down there. It wasn't someone we knew. It was about 12 o'clock at night now. What's he doing sitting there? That was all I knew. But I wasn't afraid. So I kind of just uh, looked at him for a moment and uh, I, can I uh, help you in any way? He looked at me and said, um, no, I, uh, I used to live in this place about 85, 90 years ago, and uh, I came back just to go over some things. And I said, oh, okay. Um, so I went about and I checked how many zippers we had and wrote it down on a pad, and, and I turned to him and I said, um, should I leave the light on or off or what? Uh, and he says, it doesn't matter. I said, okay. And I went and closed the door, locked it, went upstairs. I'm sure I'd had a glass of wine that night, but just as I saw those UFOs, I saw that person there. Um, I told Nan about it in the morning. Um, Nan is not one to be surprised at those things. She's had some rather unusual experiences. About two months later, I saw this person again, sitting there. And that time he just told me, he said it was the last time he was coming, he just had to go through some, some things. And, uh, and that, that was it. Um, so I know what I saw. I'm not making it up. I saw him twice. I also know the building was over 100 years old, so he could have been there 85, 90 years earlier. And uh, for whatever reason, he had to go back there and find out something. Zombies, vampires, and werewolves. Well, a lot of mythology behind that, a lot of different strange ideas. Um, People have seen various things that they might call zombies, vampires, and werewolves. Whether they exist or not, I don't know. Out-of-body experiences. Anyone had any one of those? 
I've told you about my background over the weeks. Um, I had a therapeutic community in New York City and we had a four-story building and we ran therapy groups there seven days a week, um, hundreds of groups. And we were innovators, certainly, in that uh, we ran so many different types of groups. Besides standard therapy groups, we ran uh, groups for losing weight, um, groups for depression, we ran uh, a lunacy group, um, bioenergetics group, hypnosis group, dozens of different groups. And one of our members, Lenny Zinn, came to me and he had the idea for a different type of group. He called it a fantasy group, where people would just sit around and one person at a time would lie on a pillow, one of our huge pillows, and trip out, fantasize something positive, like um, the perfect relationship, the perfect home, the perfect job, the perfect vacation. So it was a very positive kind of thing. And the group grew in size and uh, became one of our regular ongoing groups. And Lenny kept pestering me to join in the group once. And I told him, usually I'm so busy, I'm running God knows how many groups a week myself. And uh, finally, out of courtesy to Lenny, I realized that I should just sit in for one group. So I came one night and uh, they said, well, you haven't been here to our group before, Nicholas, so you should be the first one to... to. So I said, great. So I got out on the pillow and uh, laid out there and everyone gathered around me and Lenny looked at me and said, uh, you got some idea of what you want to do as your fantasy trip? And I said, you know, I hadn't thought about it. I didn't think you were going to put me on the spot right away. I, I have nothing clear in mind. And Lenny had known me for several years and he knew of my love for Greece and uh, this piece of land we had there. And he had heard me speak a number of times about our dream of building a home on this piece of land, on this island. And, and so he, he suggested I fantasize being on my land in Greece, on the island, and building a home there. So I said, that sounds wonderful. So I closed my eyes and I quickly tripped out. It took moments to just be on that land. I can picture it now. It's about a half a kilometer outside of the village of Nausa. There's a dirt road and to the left of the dirt road there is a piece of land, approximately 16 acres, that goes up to the very top on a slight incline and you can look out and see the island of Naxos out there. You can see the Bay of Nausa this way and monasteries this way. It's a beautiful, beautiful area. And wherever you are on that land, you can smell the thyme and the oregano that's growing there. So I'm lying there and I'm describing the scene to the group just as I've described it to you. And uh, the sun is shining and I can feel myself the you know, feeling that sun on me and I can hear donkeys braying in the distance and there's some bells going off in the monastery and I can smell the thyme and the oregano and I'm just at total peace and I'm beginning to think about that little spot on the very top where I'd like to build the house and as I'm doing that I suddenly begin to feel something happening that I couldn't describe but I know my voice began to change and the sun that was there suddenly was clouded over and the sounds, every sound ceased. The smell of the oregano and thyme did not you know, come across to me then. It was like everything was flattened out and I felt myself trying to go back to that perfect fantasy, but I couldn't. Everything was getting darker and darker and I began to feel that something was wrong with my body. It didn't ache, but it was not my body. You can feel your own body, you know your own body, whether your eyes are closed or open. But this body was much older and was getting older by the second. And now I began to hear Lenny calling to me, Nicholas, are you all right? Can you come out of this? What's wrong? What's happening? 
And I knew I couldn't reach Lenny. And I knew he couldn't reach me. And suddenly my body began to feel like it was about a hundred years old. Felt, you know, leathery and just, it was not me. And now I began to speak Greek, island Greek, which I cannot speak. I speak a, a common Greek that you would hear in Athens, but I do not speak island Greek. It has a distinctive different sound and it's like a different dialect. Um, and the voice that was coming out of me was not my voice because I know how I project. I've taught it for so many decades. I've studied vocalizing and voice projection. I know how I speak and how my voice comes out. This was a different voice. It was coming from the chest and throat and it wasn't my voice. And now I really was more where Lenny was really very troubled. He didn't know what was happening. He was scared. The whole group was scared because they didn't know where I was or what, what they could do. And I knew they couldn't do anything. And this voice kept coming out of me and this, out of this hundred-year-old body. And then suddenly it's like a light switch. And I was back. There was no transition. There was no... It was just suddenly I'm back. And then he just looks at me and he's sweating. He says, who was that? And I didn't have to think. I just looked at him and said, my grandfather. I knew that my grandfather had, call it possession. I don't know what you should call it. Um, they asked me other questions. I said, did you have any sense of what he was telling you? And I said, what I made out of it was he was warning me of something that was going wrong that I needed to know about. Two years later, on a subsequent visit to the island, um, I found out what he was warning me about. Some of my uncles, who had never expected me to ever visit the land, had uh, made out some reports, some false documents, stating that my father, when he passed away, did not have any children, so that his land was not passed on to me and my brother. They did this in order to use the land. They explained it innocently enough. They didn't think, they, they didn't think that we would want the land to go to waste, so they appropriated it for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and that was what my grandfather was warning me about. Did that happen? It happened in front of 15 other people. Um, it happened. Um, the meaning of dreams, um, lucid dreaming, astral projection. Uh, I've been mentioning over the course of these classes that uh, I've been studying dreams for a long time and I've gone into a whole different direction with them in recent years because I've experienced things in dreams that I can no longer explain. There are uh, distinctly three different dream stages for most people, and sometimes these stages uh, interplay with one another, um, but basically um, the first stage happens shortly after we go to sleep, and uh, usually quick flashes of things that uh, have no real meaning, have no, you can't really describe them. You might see a hundred different things in, a, in flashes from moment to moment. And uh, this dream sequence is not very long. It might uh, be 30 seconds or a minute or two. And there's a second sequence later on in the sleep pattern um, where we do things, where we're sometimes flying or experiencing things, being chased, Something is happening, but it's flights, and it's, it's movement, and it's uh, sometimes scary. And there's a third dream sequence that usually takes place at the very end period of our sleep, and it's the longest. This is when we dream for 25 or 30 minutes or 45 minutes, and sometimes it's a story. It's a whole damn scenario taking place. You know, you've seen, experienced that, I'm sure. You know, and if you remember it, you, know, you wonder what it was all about and who the characters were about. Um, 
I keep a pad and pen right beside me and I've trained myself to write in the dark because I don't want to wake Nan up and I'll write down what my dreams are and because I am not fully awake I've trained myself also to fold right back into the dream to put myself back into the same position I was in and just go right back into the dream and you can't train yourself to do that just as you can train yourself to do lucid dreaming it just, it's like hypnosis, you have to do it over a long period of time and slowly you begin to find a way of doing it and your body and mind begin to work together in harmony and you're able to do it. And I've been having these dreams and writing them down and going back into them and examining the content, the actual scenario. And in one, um, I'm conducting music. Well, I've had that kind of a dream hundreds of times because my first real ambition at the age of seven was to be a conductor. That has always been my great dream fantasy um, and I still intend to do that, to study conducting. I'll be in my 80s when I finally start doing it professionally, but that's my goal. So there's nothing unusual about my conducting in, in a dream. But in this particular dream, I'm conducting an orchestra um, and I've got the score in front of me which contains the music and the libretto and I'm conducting, it's an Italian I've sung one or two Italian songs I sung uh, Sorrento um, I might know a half dozen Italian words but I don't speak Italian I certainly don't read Italian and I also know what I can do in terms of reading music. I sang professionally for a number of years, so I can read a song. But I know what my limitations are. I cannot read a symphony or an opera or concerto. I cannot read those notes, conduct them, and I cannot understand Italian. But yet in my dream, I am understanding the Italian and conducting the notes that I'm seeing on that paper. So how is this happening? When I go over my notes and I think about it and ask myself, well, what are the options? What could be happening? My thoughts uh, go toward one, um, karma, reincarnation past life. That somehow that is still embedded in my being somewhere. So that is one possible explanation. Another explanation which I tend to favor over the reincarnation is that somehow I am tuning in on the wavelength of another soul. But somehow there is a soulmate, there is an interplay between other souls. And I find that to make sense. Because I do believe in souls. As I said with Tucker, I believed that I called upon, then I called upon my father's soul to be reincarnated as our son. I have seen ghosts. Nan, who is a very very astute and honest and honorable human being. I've never known man ever to tell a lie. I don't think it's possible for her. Um, it's something inside of her that just doesn't operate that way. Um, and I've been with her 44 years and I've, you know, we've had ups and downs and strange times, but I've never heard her make something up, concoct something. Um, yet, Shortly after I met her, she told me about her mother who had committed suicide and very matter-of-factly looked at me and said, the day after my mother died, she visited me. She came to me and talked to me. And I believed every word of it. I know it to be true to this day. So I know souls exist. 
I don't know if a God exists, you know, I don't, I, I follow Einstein's thinking, he didn't believe that this individual God force that has a personal involvement with each of us and can change things for each of us, I, I don't, Einstein believed in this force, this universal force that exists, and I believe that, but I do believe in souls, I believe we have souls, and I see no reason why those souls cannot be connecting with us. And certainly on one level, that's a perfect time during a dream. Because too often I've had these dreams about people who are not an amalgamation of other people, a facsimile of other people, whose bearing and character and individuality were so clear, I would have been able to recognize part of that if it was from someone I did know. Along with these types of dreams where Suddenly I'm doing something that I cannot do, I'm not capable of doing. So I have to believe that something else is going on in the dream state. And I truly believe that is the case. And uh, as is true with so much of what we think we know a lot about that we don't, dreams are the same thing. People have been studying dreams for God knows how long, but along the same lines pretty much and haven't really stretched out the way they need to. The Mayan prophecy, will it, will we all end, is it December 21st instead of the 12th? I think, I think I made a mistake with that. Well, when we think about that, what do we mean end? I mean, um, does it necessarily have to be this cataclysmic explosion where the planet is torn apart and we all are gone? Or could it simply mean the end of a period, the end of something that we know, the end of our current phase of being? Um, and could it not come about in various ways, mysterious or otherwise? Could it not come about economically, spiritually, um, physically, environmentally? It's possible, right? So there may be something to that. And then when we think about dear Edgar and his legacy, the universal or super consciousness, of all the so-called prophets, um, people who were able to see in the future, uh, the two most famous are Nostradamus, of course, and the person who lived in a more contemporary times, dear Edgar. Um, he's been studied probably more than anyone because his records are open. And there's an institute down there in, I think it's Virginia, Virginia Beach, I believe. Um, and he was able to do all these thousands of readings and interpret them. And they seem to be so dead on, accurate, so frequently. He envisioned so many things that actually came about. Um, and of the people who have studied his legacy, all of his readings, and there are some people who have studied him the way they study Shakespeare, they make a career out of it practically, and uh, they all trust in what he was able to see, what his visions were. Um, he possessed a talent that was extraordinary, as many people did, including Tucker. I've spoken at length with people who were with Tucker. And again, the difference between talking about a Tucker and talking about a Muhammad or Jesus or Moses is that those beings, those personalities, lived in another time, another century. We don't have photographs of those people, we don't have recordings of those people, and whatever their teachings were have been passed along for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So what we're reading are things that have obviously been rewritten, edited. In fact, all of these teachings by any of these prophets have undergone tremendous change because there are so many different divisions, sects, groups, you know, in all of these various religions who have changed and reworded and rewritten, you know. But talkers have not been rewritten. What we have of talker are immediate. He died in 1969. 
every word he took down was taken down by scribes. And nothing has been changed. We actually have his actual words on every topic imaginable. He has a volume this thick on every topic. You name a word, he's got a volume this thick on it. And I had the benefit, the privilege, of knowing two people who were with him for 25 years. Two people who were dear friends, who were very, very intelligent people. These were not quacks. These were not uh, people looking to promote anything. And to, you know, No, nothing like that. Um, Ray Hauserman was as down to earth as any person I knew, and Ed Spencer was, uh, was an absolute uh, one in a hundred million. Um, he's the type of person you could write ten movies about. He conducted himself in life in a way that was so extraordinary it's hard to really describe it. He kept nothing for himself. He lived on the road for the most part. He gave and gave and gave of himself freely. He followed Tucker's wishes, the ideal of love before you speak of love. And Spence, at his own leanings and at Tucker's urgings, um, went on the road to discover the true nature of Jesus and if he had in fact died on the cross and uh, actually discovered a place in India in Kashmir where he believed Jesus finally ended and died. Um, but we're talking about a, a scholarly person um, and uh, two real wonderful people who were with Taka for 25 years and they described what we would consider to be miracles along the lines of what all the other godlike figures and prophets have been able to do. Only Tucker, like these other god figures before him, did not think of them as miracles. He said anyone can do this. It's just a matter of being able to reach that level of knowledge and understanding and wisdom and enlightenment, although I don't think he used those words about himself any more than he called himself God. When asked if he was God, he would say, I am whatever you believe me to be. But yet, these people, and I've spoken with dozens of others who were there in India with him, have seen these miracles. One that they saw literally a dozen times, Taka would dance, he would do this Indian dance called the Kirtan, which is a leaping, wild kind of thing. And Taka would practically go into a frenzy, a trance-like state, you know, dancing and dancing for hours, and then collapse. There'd be hundreds of people there witnessing this. And they'd gather around him, and there'd be doctors there, and they'd examine him. No pulse, no heart, nothing, he's dead. Hours would go by. And suddenly Taka would open his eyes and get up and he'd start and be alive again. And not treat it as anything unusual. Now, again, am I going to assume that since this sounds impossible, that therefore all of these people are liars, deceivers, frauds, that Ray Hauserman and Ed Spence are both making this up? That's what I have to assume if I am to, you know, deny this fact. So what do we believe? What is it all about? Um, and to my way of thinking, uh, it's exactly what is out there. Universal things that we have yet to understand, that we may not understand for a thousand years. Um, strange things that do happen. People are experiencing things that they're actually living through, they're real, they're not imagined. Unusual things exist. And if they do, then we can assume that this universe is made up of some unusually extraordinary things that we cannot explain in our current standard or level. We're just not there yet to be able to do that. Maybe in a hundred years or five hundred years, maybe we'll have a greater understanding. Maybe by that time, we will have found the means to 
the in contact, that close encounter of the third kind contact with other living species, and we'll begin to realize what it's all about. Currently, we cannot. But at least on whatever level we believe something, we should be able to write it down on paper and say, I believe in this, this, and this, and consequently, I live my life this way, this way, this way. This is what it represents to me, so that it, in fact, is part of us, as opposed to it just being this thing that we keep separate from. Questions, thoughts, comments, I'd like to hear from everyone on this, including this general idea of what it is you believe and what part does it play in your life, or what could this open up for you to make you take a look at. It's hard to put all that just kind of a couple sentences. Mm -hmm. It's just a, um, I've, for me, it's, it's, it's constantly changing as I learn and grow. Um, I believe in the power that there's something greater than my own physical self here. So as I just explore that, I just really become more and more at peace. So how do I define it? I don't think I can define it in words. Um, but it's a c constant exploration of, of just what, what's it all about? Just, and, and not being afraid of it anymore. I think that my, my biggest growth over the years of, of me exploring my spirituality is I'm not afraid anymore. And I've lived so much of my life in fear. Um, fear of what, not knowing what it's all about. What if I get it wrong? And what if, what if, what if? And now it's like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's all going to be fine. Um, uh, life is a joy. And, um, and I try and remind myself of that all the time. That it's, it's all great. Um, and even even the hard stuff isn't. And I don't I don't. And I'm getting away from this polarization myself too. There's not a right or wrong. There, it just is. And um, so what do I want to experience with it, one way or the other? Do I, I find value? I find I find something of value. I can find something of value in anything. Mm -hmm. I'm an eternal optimist. Yes. <laughs> so and that's what I and that's how I try and live my life. And it, it gives me much more peace, much more tolerance, and much more joy. And I have to practice it all the time because I have my meltdowns and my frustrations and my unkindnesses and all that stuff too. But I always come back to, but that's okay because I, I, I now have a solid foundation of which I can always come back to. And I know it's there. I, I can find it any time. Uh, so when I do stray off, it's not so scary because I know I'm coming back. Question. What if... Um UFO suddenly landed, and the door opened, and they said, Jean, would you like to join us, go for a trip? Yeah, I would be really tempted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would hope that if I saw a ghost or a paranormal or a, or a UFO or you know, whatever the case may be, that my trained instinct of fear would not overcome me, and I would say, Whoa! <laughs> pick me, pick me! <laughs> yeah, I think it would be amazing to, to explore something that's so far out of our current understanding and experience of life and the universe. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that's what I do. What would I do? I, I don't know. <laughs> At that moment, yes, we'd be faced with, you know, yeah. a real conflict of sorts, you know, mm -hmm. within ourselves. Um, I've explored that question many times, and um, yes, I'd want to go. I would definitely want to go. Yeah. Someone else? <coughs> I can talk. Lisa? Okay. Uh, well, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot to say. Um, I, uh, I think when I was a, a kid um, in, in church, I remember as a teenager, starting to think, well, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't believe in this God and He and a number of things, and so I had decided that, you know, I didn't believe in, in that, and I think at the, at the time, you know, I only really knew about 
a couple of choices. And so I became an atheist for a long time, you know. But then when I saw um, What the Bleep Do We Know, the, that movie, yeah? yeah, it opened up so many more choices, really. And I was very excited, and I spent the whole next day going to the bookstore and listening to things and all kinds of stuff. And um, uh, yeah, I mean that movie t talks about all kinds of other things, and it's and it's um, it's science too, you know. Uh, also, I had a, um, a professor in college that was an anthropology professor, and he was very he had come up with some very different ideas uh, from the common, uh, very um, politically incorrect and whatnot. And um, I really liked him, although he uh, he you know talked he actually spoke about religion and what he had come up with this to, uh, different types of religion and what they were really about. And he also said you know well if we you know, these people are saying things and we can't see that. You know, they're saying that this person lives when clearly this person is dead. He says, you know, common sense will tell you this person is dead. And, you know, I had also, um, I was like, well, that makes a lot of sense. And I, you know, went with that for so many years too. But, you know, after my mind really got opened up and I started seeing other things, like, you know, there's a lot of things that we can't see. <laughs> You know, you can't see love, you know, you can't see thoughts, you know, there's all kinds of things that we can't see. I mean, and uh, uh, I also had another experience a few years after that where I had had this major uh, back pain, um, really bad back pain, where I didn't sit down or move my spine for a few weeks, you know. And my do doc, I got an MRI, and my doctor told me I had a, uh, a bulging disc, and, and my pain got even worse that day after he told me that. <laughs> and then I read a book about how the mind um, affects the body and how we can actually create pain. And after I read the, the book, actually just a, like a half an hour after I read the book, my pain was completely gone, like completely. And uh, so that was a, a huge life-changing experience for me. And I felt that, you know, well, my goodness, if, if that is possible, if my mind is that powerful, um, there's, there's, there could be all kinds of things that, you know, and I, thought, well, you know, we can also create cancer and, you know, all kinds of other things, uh, and, and um, we can, you know, some of the, um, you know, they talk about how the, the, uh, the tsunami that happened in Thailand, uh, how the animals left, mm -hmm. uh, elephants. yeah, the elephants yeah. came out of their chains that they've been in for 10 years, and, no animals died. They, they were like long gone. Yes. Yes. Yeah. They knew. The animals were in touch with something where they knew, you know. And I feel like, um, you know, especially after my back pain experience, that there is a whole thing in, in our minds that uh, that we can could access. So we're, you know, there's so much more there. You know? Yeah. And then also I've had lots of um, experiences about uh, just connections, uh, coincidences, um, you know, someone calling you that you were just thinking about. And you know, I gave my mother flowers one year for Mother's Day, and she said she wanted me to give her flowers, and I'd never given her flowers. And, uh, you know, I've had a number of, of experiences like that, and you know, now that I'm really more tuned into it, I see it happening all the time. You know, and uh, like I'm 
looking for it now. And it, it happens a lot. Uh, and I also saw this movie, The Living Matrix. The Living Matrix, not The Matrix. And um, they talk about, um, it's a lot about mind, mind body connection, but also about how we have this body field around us, which I think is probably you know, close to what people talk about, auras and energies and things. And that, um, you know, uh, people actually, have, they've done, they've studied people, like uh, couples where uh, they would ha have one person in one room and someone in another room and ha have them hooked up to different equipment and that they would think, one of them would think things that they wanted to tell the other person and that person actually you know, heard these things or experienced something differently when they were saying these things. And, um, so, uh, yeah. yeah, overall, the important thing is to know what you have experienced, to really know, and then again to say, okay, what does that mean? How do you use that in life? If we don't, then we're kind of dummies, really. Someone else, Mary? Well, um, <coughs> a friend, a good friend of mine was dying of cancer in 2009, and I went to visit her. It was a week before she passed, but actually about two weeks. And I went to uh, Virginia Mason, I think is where she was. And I had been sick the week before, but I felt I was well enough to go see her. And when I got to her room, um, she said, you can't come in here. And she, she did a block. And at first I was like, well, let's, I thought, well, maybe because she thought I was sick or something that I was going to give her whatever I had. But now that I've, she's passed and what, what I think was going on, in that room as she was transitioning to wherever she was going to dying because that her hand just blocking me there was power in that and then in the room it was like I was <laughs> standing on the edge of a, the abyss and here was the universe before me or something it was just something was going on in that room I don't know what but I had this feeling I had and I you know, so I had to say goodbye to her from the doorway. And um, it was sad, but I, I respected whatever she was doing, going to next. It was an amazing kind of experience I shared with her. Um, I've had a lot of death in my life, starting from 13. So I've made it through all of it. And I now, where I am now, I, um, I just, I think I experienced the, the the world a little different than most people because you know I've experienced a lot of loss and I um I don't know where I'm going with this but I know that it's giving me it's given me something where in my younger years I never would have thought that it was any good would have ever come out of any of it but now you know it it has on some weird level in some soul level. I, I have a little different understanding of this world in my own weird way, kind of going through some hard stuff. It's like I just see things a little different. And I don't know if that's spiritual stuff. You know, like with my friend, I felt very, that like there was some real spiritual stuff going on in that room. So I believe that there's, that there's something out there. Again to, again, to be redundant, <clears throat> find out what you believe as best as possible, focus in on it, and then apply it in your life, and really look at it objectively. Are you applying it in your life? Especially when it comes to dealing with fear in general. Um, because if we examine the idea of spirit just for what it is, something outside of ourselves, something that exists, then that should have a meaning that can counteract fear. On some level or another, we've got to be able to do that. Because um, 
we're certainly not going in the right direction with our fears in general. We're not acting upon them, we're not responding, and we're not overcoming the fear. And what could help us more than have a clearer spiritual sense, spirit sense? That could help us overcome fear in so many ways. Um, well, I mean, I've been thinking about th this sort of question, I mean, what if I witnessed, and, I mean, well, there are really two things that come to mind. I mean, first of all, um, I have a degree in physics, and I work at a university. I'm not faculty, I'm, I'm just staff. So, I mean, I'm in this academic environment where, you know, there's a certain expectation for you know, what constitutes scientific proof of something. And, you know, in my own personal experience, I don't know if I've seen that with regards to certain things, you know, of this nature. Um, but I'm certainly inclined to believe in some, you know, sort of paranormal things happening. And, you know, this reminds me of one thing is that I used to correspond with this guy named Al Fry, who had a little company called Fry's Incredible Inquiries, and he sold these books, which were just, you know, about all kinds of amazing and incredible topics like, you know, Bigfoot or ancient astronauts and aliens, and, and it just went on and on, you know, hollow earth theory. And, you know, I would think about it sometimes, and I think, well, I'm not even sure if, if any of the things in this catalog could be true. But sometimes I just look at the catalog and I think, well, could I imagine a, a sort of world where, where everything in here is actually true, and yet, you know, it still appears, you know, to have the same everyday appearance that I experience, and, and yet have this world where these things could in fact all be true at the same time. And then, if that's the case, what would that mean for me, you know, how would that affect my day-to-day -day life or how I interact with the world? And, I'm still not sure if I have an answer to that question, but I do think it was an interesting sort of exercise to do. The question you asked and the question we're all asking, directly or indirectly, the what if? What if these things were really true? Um, what if there was so much more out there? And what would happen if we acknowledged it? What kind of beings would we then become? Who would we be? And that's really, once again, the central question. If we are to genuinely accept and acknowledge that these strange, unusual, Things actually exist, that the soul exists, that other creatures exist, that other spirits exist in different forms, that there is so much more to life than what we currently know and understand. If, if we were to acknowledge that, how would that change our being? How would we wake up in the morning? How would we deal with life? How would we deal with other people? How would we deal with all the situations and problems that exist in our life? What would that mean in terms of solving problems, issues, and conflicts? What would it mean about our fears, about money, about possessions, about home, about climate change, about everything? What would that really do? What would the cause and effect be? And that's really what we have to look at more and more. Because without that, there is no wisdom, there's no enlightenment. It's almost as if we're learning and it's going by us, and uh, okay, so what? Which is the true case with what, in terms of what our human condition is like. We've learned nothing. We've only advanced technologically, but on all the other important areas of life, we haven't gone anywhere. We're going over the same ground over and over again, as Spence said so many times. And uh, we're not learning, we're not moving forward. 
So I know I'm being very redundant, but it really is for each of us as individuals to look at what we believe, ask ourselves, what do we really, truly acknowledge, and how can that, and how will that change our lives? Who will we be tomorrow when we finally see this and say it's real? From God's own board, each day I die. From the Bering Straits to Palestine, this spring, this brook will ring the bell. No need of wealth, you're in God's hotel. No pills, no pills.